Welcome. Welcome to the last class of CDC. We are class number 12, and you all made it through to this. Congratulations. Please, ninth graders, the one thing you still need to do is get me the rest of your sermon reports, and I need your statement of faith no later than Monday, May 3rd. Please, please get that to me. And remember, Confirmation Sunday, May 23rd, not that far away at all. I want to look at the assignment from a couple of weeks ago. We didn't meet last Sunday because of Easter. I asked you to talk with your mentor or your parents about what it means to participate in communion. You might have had answers such as you felt a closeness to God or Jesus, that you felt forgiven. That's a biggie. That is promised every single time, isn't it? Just said it a few minutes ago. For the forgiveness of our sins. You might have felt filled. Not that it was such a big meal. But because in your faith it fills you. Perhaps you felt a sense of peace. And for me, and I think for many others, is the comfort in the rhythm of gathering and doing that every single week. I don't know what you and your mentor and your parents talked about. Probably lots of other things. One of the frustrations of this is that we don't have that back and forth conversation. But nevertheless, I trust that you had that conversation and that it has been meaningful for you. I also asked you to consider those words that Luther picks up and is, are so important. Given for you, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Given for you, the bread. Shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, the blood. And what did that mean to you? Some of your answers might have been that it was very personal, and it is. In that case, we are to understand you as single. You. You who are listening, you who are hearing, you, you individually. It's very, very personal. On the other hand, you do it together. It's not something you do all by yourself. So there is the sharing that understanding with everyone who knows it's for them as well. There's something very powerful in that sharing. It's also an amazing reminder of God's gift to us and how that gift continues to be given moment by moment. And you know what? Every single one of us messes up. And the communion is a reassurance that we are forgiven, we are understood. Yeah, so when you haven't been your best self, communion says, it's okay, let's move on. I hope that you had a meaningful conversation, or if you haven't yet, that you will, about communion. It is such an important center of our time together in worship. And that it, it means so much to people. As a pastor, I've had the opportunity to take communion to people who are dying, people who are very sick, people who are alone, or people who just can't leave home or are in a nursing care, care facility. It's amazing. They are so thrilled, often with tears, to have that. And I always tell them, no, we're not in church, but Jesus has said, where two or three are gathered, I am there in the midst. And if it was just the two of us, I'd say, and here, here's the two. And Jesus is here. It is a beautiful, beautiful sacrament that we partake in. Today, we move to seasons and colors in the church. And doesn't the church just looks so pretty with all these different colors. I love this 
display. It just seems like a perfect thing to do with the day after Easter, doesn't it? But we're going to talk about each of these and why we use them and what those colors represent for us. That'll take up some of our time. At that point, eighth graders, you're free to leave if you want to, or you can stay on. The last few minutes, I will be going over the guidelines for the statement of faith for the ninth graders. Now, again, eighth graders, you can stay on. It's very, very likely with a different pastor, your confirmation experience will be different through fall and into 2022, and may ask a very different statement of faith. So what I'm asking for probably won't be the same as what that new person is asking for. But nevertheless, it gives, it'll be those basics, I'm sure, and it gives you something to think about if you'd like to. So let's get on with our colors. The colors of the season are represented by the way, for lack of a better word, the way we decorate the church. And so it's a different color depending on what the liturgical season, the word meaning the cycle of what we pay attention to within a year. And it's repeated every year. Um, let's see here. Let me move on. So many, many thanks to the people who have decorated this. Now let's look at them. First of all, correct me and anyone else. These are not decorations. They are called paraments. The word is from a very, it's, it was, it's very old. It was used in Eng England. It was first known in English in the 1300s. Earlier than that in French, its origin is Latin, the Latin word for dress for religious services or sacred furniture. And so that's what it is. It's a dress for sacred furniture. The liturgical year is the cycle of seasons and the time of the year for Christians. And it begins, the first day of our liturgical year is the first Sunday of Advent. Now, when we look at the calendar, that isn't always a specific date, like Christmas is always the 25th. It is, sometimes it's the Sunday, the last Sunday in November, sometimes it's the first Sunday in December. It starts with the first of four Sundays before Christmas. And it's the time that we reflect Jesus' birth and look forward to his coming. Now, in the past, years ago, the color for that was purple. In more recent years, it's been decided that they want to differentiate, want to make it different from when else that is used. And so we have blue, like we have here on the communion table. And ordinarily then, every place where you see a paramount would also be blue. Blue was chosen for many reasons. It's the that's kind of a new birth. It's the beauty of the sky. It is also the traditional color for Mary. So blue is the thing that we use for the four Sundays of Advent. And then when Christmas comes and Epiphany, that time after Christmas, we switch and we go to white. Now you see the paraments that are there at the Christ candle. That would be all over, everything would be white. And that's why we use it. And why does that say? Because it shows light. I mean, what reflects more light than the color white? And therefore, it is the joy in light that we are celebrating by having this white color. Now, Following Epiphany comes a time we call ordinary time. One of you wrote me and asked, ordinary time? That sounds so, well, frankly, ordinary. Why, why is it? That is because during ordinary time, there's no special event like Christmas or Easter or Lent. And it's rather being about the business of being a church. 
What is that? It is the mission in the world. In other words, it's the church doing the day in, day out, week by week business of being servants of Jesus. And that, because it's also falls to time when we're growing things and when things are um, verdant and gorgeous, green. Green is the color for ordinary time. And so again, during ordinary time, which first falls after Christmas, before Lent, this would be all over and everything would be green. Now, the next season is the season we went through just recently, the season of Lent. And that is a time for self-examination, for study, for fasting, for prayer, and for works of love. It's a time for personal reflection. What do I need to change? How can I be a better follower of Jesus? That season lasts 40 days, not counting the Sundays. Now, that comes from the Bible. The 40 days that Jesus spent being tempted in the wilderness, or the 40 years that the Israelites were in the, in the wilderness, also wandered in the wilderness. So it means wilderness. It means going through Oh my goodness, how can I be a better Christian? How can I serve God better? What is it that God would like for me to do? And that begins on Ash Wednesday. That's the first Sunday. Again, this is all based on um, lunar um, decisions made many, many years ago. So Lent is not, again, like it's not like Christmas where it's the 25th. It is, it varies, and this year it was much early, <clears throat> earlier than others. So Ash Wednesday, you may remember, is the time when we make the sign of the cross on forehead or hand of, with ashes. And it is a time when we remember our own humility. We are from dust, and to dust we will turn. And that's true of everybody. I don't care if it's the highest person in government or someone with the most menial job. It's the same. There's something very equalizing about that. And the color for that is purple. And that is hanging over here on the pulpit. And that beautiful pyramid that that is. And again, that would be through the whole church. And you probably remember seeing it quite recently. And by the way, the pastors also wear a stole over their alb or robe that matches that color. So up until Easter time, I've been wearing the purple stole that matches that. It's very lovely, very, very pretty. Now on Monday, Thursday, which, what does that mean? It actually refers to the washing of feet and the Last Supper. It is, that's what we're talking about with Maundy Thursday. And remember, we talked about that. that some churches do the celebration of the washing of feet. Some do not. But on Thursday, the Maundy Thursday, there's always the um, serving of communion and remembering the Last Supper. And by the end of that service, now this year it started that way, but by the end of that service, the whole chancel is stripped of any pyramids. Everything is gone. It's very, very bleak. And then when Good Friday happens, there is no color. There are no decorations. I have been in one church where they had black pyramids. But that's pretty unusual. Mostly, it's just bare. The Christ candle is gone. All of the candles are gone. Everything. It, it really helps us understand the drama of, of Good Friday. Well, of course, then, in three days, Easter comes. And Easter is white. And here we have this beautiful banner that not only 
has the gorgeous symbols on it, but also is that white. And that, remember, at Christmas time, we said it came from the joy of light. Light comes back to the world. On Good Friday, it's dark, it's empty. But on Easter, it's filled with light. And that's what we're celebrating with the white. And so that lasts for 50 days until we get to Pentecost. Now, Pentecost, ninth graders, is also when you will be confirmed. It is the color that we use the least often, but it's extraordinarily important, and it is so gorgeous when we use it. And that is the color of red, which we have here on our altar. And it represents the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is represented, again, through Bible reference, by flames. And so the red being fire. It is a fiery, flame-filled time. And it is the time when we truly understand and recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we go through that time when church was founded, when church began, when church was blessed. And then the remainder of the year, with a few exceptions, is back to ordinary time and to the green. So that kind of gives you a very quick overlay of why we change the colors and what those colors mean and what it helps us understand. The, the purple of Lent, more pensive, more thoughtful. The white of Christmas and Easter, bringing the joy of light. And at Christmas, don't we need light? That's the darkest time of the year. And we need that light. The bright red of the Holy Spirit being here. The pensiveness of Lent, as I said, and then the verdant of what is ordinary time, growing, going out, and being for people what Christ has asked us to do. So that's it. I would ask you, eighth and ninth graders, to have one last assignment to talk with your mentor about the colors and the seasons of the church. What difference would it make if we didn't ever change the color? Let's say it's always white and it never, ever changed. Or what difference would it make if there were no colors? You had the red carpet and the brown wood, and that's all. What are the other ways that we do decorate, particularly at Easter, this gorgeous display that the gals have made for us? And thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Donna. And perhaps Ada was a part of this, of decorating this place in all these colors. Thank you. Thank you. But what difference would it make if we didn't have that. It'd be the same, I suspect. But I think it's worthy of pondering. What, what does it feel like when you come in and see purple? What does it feel like when you come in and there's nothing? What does it feel like when it's bright red? So I ask you to consider that with your mentor and your parents. And with that, I also ask you to Pat yourself on the back. We have completed CDC. In these 12 classes, you have gone through a number of things, starting with the Bible and moving forward through so much. It's probably different than it's been taught before and different than it will be taught in the future, but then so is COVID and all that that has to do with it. So congratulations for all of you who have participated. And thank you. Um,
Please get your written materials in, then I know it's made a difference for you. But different than if I'm in every face and I can look at somebody and say, Susie Q, you still haven't done that, or Sammy, you haven't done this. I am not doing that. Confirmation is a time to recognize stepping into being an adult. And being an adult means you make your own decisions. And I have hoped and I pray daily that your decision has been to embrace what has been offered here and will continue as your life develops and as your faith develops. May it be a solid foundation for you for the rest of your life. So for eighth graders, that's it. We are finished. You are welcome to stay if you'd like to and talk about the statement of faith, but you don't need to. But before you go, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious and holy God, thank you. Thank you for the faith of these young people. Thank you for the guidance of their mentors. Thank you for the encouragement and the faith of their parents. Be with all, adults and youth alike, that they may know your presence and your guidance every single day. May these youth know that you matter and that you matter in their life. And equally important, that they matter to you. You love everyone as they are, who they are, and you hold them to your heart. And for that, we give you thanks. Even as we give you thanks for the gift of your son, the risen Christ that we celebrate during these wonderful days, the Savior, the one who gave all, for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, God, and be with these wonderful folk. We pray this in all our prayers, in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Okay, ninth graders. Statement of faith outline. Again, probably not exactly what an older brother or sister did. Probably won't be what a younger brother or sister will do. But here's what I'm asking based on what we've done through CDC. I need a paper, and I've given you five topics that I would like for you to write at least a paragraph on each of those topics. You can choose to write more, but I need at least a paragraph, which is more than two sentences, <laughs> about those topics. Please, please type it. Or if you need to have mom type it for you, fine, and double space it. That makes it so much easier for me to read and to understand. So the very first one is to have you talk about your faith journey. Well, by faith journey, I mean, where were you when you were little? When was the first time you, were, you understood about God that you remember? When was the first time you understood about Jesus that, that you remember? And how was it? Like, what was the first prayer you learned? Did you pray a prayer together with your mom when you went to bed? Or a prayer that people prayed at the table? Or maybe it was just your own prayer. What has been a special moment? Something that made you go, wow. Or maybe a time that's been tough when you might not even felt God's presence or you were angry with God or you, you were like, I don't get it. Talk to me about that journey. All of what I've suggested is normal and everyone has it. The happy times, the hard times, the questions, the certainties, 
the things you've learned. The next one, choose a person, or if you can't choose, only one, persons, that's been particularly important in your life. Who's had an influence on your faith? And whose model is it that you had? For me, if I were writing this, that would have been my grandmother who taught me so much. And I won't go into the story, but she would sit in her rocker and was sewing and I'd sit on the little stool next to her and we'd just talk. And sometimes we'd sing hymns. Some of my favorite hymns are ones that grandma taught me. Now, mom and dad did great things for me. That's not to say they weren't wonderful in my faith journey, but I really remember what grandma did for me, my grandma. Who is it for you? It might be a teacher. It might be one of your parents. It might be an aunt or an uncle, your sponsor, a neighbor, a Sunday school teacher. You know, who is it that's helped you decide to develop and cling to the faith that you have? And then if you can, talk a little bit about how that's happened. Number three. What do you believe right now? What is your belief? If you were to write a statement that says, or you would have somebody said, okay, what do you believe in? You're a Christian, right? Okay, what do you believe in? What would you say? How do you understand God? How do you understand Jesus, the Christ? What does the Holy Spirit mean to you? Now, this isn't a test. You don't have to be, oh, he didn't say anything about that. She didn't even mention that. No, that's not it. I want honesty. Where are you on your faith journey in terms of when asked, what do you believe? What are your answers? What's helped you? And there are some suggestions in the sheet that I've given you. How's that, how have you gotten there from Bible to looking at the Apostles' Creed, to looking at the sacraments from um, baptism to communion. And speaking of baptism, in that first paragraph, please include the date of your baptism. I do need that. Thank you very much for doing that in the very first paragraph on your faith journey, because that's a part of your faith journey. Number four, what does confirmation mean for you? As you prepare to be confirmed on the 23rd of May and have blessing upon you, what does that mean? What, what difference does it make? You're the same person before or after. I get that. And yet, it matters. What difference does it make for you and does it make any difference on how you'll be and act and think from that point on as a confirmed member of the church? And finally, what's God calling you to do for your life? Yes, but also right now. Every one of us is called. Every one of us has something God wants us to do. What is that for you? It changes. It goes down one avenue and it may go down another. But everyone has that. And how do you think right now God is calling you in the future? That may change. But right now, what are you thinking? Look at your gifts. What are the things that people say, wow, you're really good at that or things that you want to develop because you really w haven't had a chance, but that seems something that really pulls, I'd like to learn that, or I'd like to do that. How does that fit in to what God is calling you? What is it that you really enjoy? Often that is, not always, but often that also fits in to what God is calling you. So spend some time on this. I'm asking you to spend some prayer time on it. Actually talk to God and ask God to guide you as you write. 
I'm really looking forward to getting them. I'm looking forward to reading them. And as best as I can, I will give you feedback. I will not ask you to read them on Confirmation Sunday. I don't do that. That's very, very important to me. I don't ask the grown-ups to read a statement of faith. I don't ask our youth. However, I will select something from each and every one of your statements of faith that will be woven into the sermon on Confirmation Day. I will not mention who you are, who the author is, but you'll know because you'll hear what you've written. So if you've got more questions, please, please be in touch. You've got my email, you've got my cell phone. Give me a call, send me a text, give me an email. I'll get back to you just as soon as I can. Do remember, this is the one requirement. If I do not have a statement of faith from you, I cannot confirm you. So it is imperative that that be brought in. And I really, really hope that you have it to me, at least by the third, due date is May 2nd. Okay, have fun, enjoy this day, and yahoo! We are finished with class. Take care now. Bye-bye.